So my name is Scott Sinner, I'm coming to you live this morning from Jonesboro, Arkansas. Uh, I apologize for not being there in person. I was originally supposed to be there in person, but um, we actually have a customer here from Japan uh, right now, and it's the first customer we've been able to host in over two years because of the pandemic. So it's it's uh, it's been a it's been exciting uh, to be able to see uh, some of our friends that that we do business with overseas. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, we the other night we were, we went out to dinner in Fargo, and um, he told us our customer told us that that was the first time that he's had a beer outside of his apartment since the pandemic started. Um, and uh, when he flew over from Tokyo, there was only 35 people on his 747 flight uh, to Minneapolis. So it was basically like flying a private jet. He said it was pretty darn nice. Um, but anyway, uh, my name is Scott Center. I'm a, I'm a partner at, at SBNB. And, uh, you know, as Claire had mentioned, um, I mean, we focus on, on food grade soybeans. And uh, do a little bit in the small grains and a little bit in pulse stuff, but uh, primarily in the soybean industry. And, and I've personally been doing uh, procurement or working with farmers and doing contracting uh, for 18 years for our company. So I've been doing it a long time and, and uh, have, seen a lot of, have seen a lot of different market uh, dynamics uh, along the way. Um, so as we go here, um, feel free to ask any questions and, uh, and we'll just kind of take it as it goes. Um, but SBNB, um, we're a global food grade soybean leader. Um, I'm fifth generation on our, on our farm. Uh, we farm just outside of Fargo and Castleton. Um, but, you know, back in the late eighties, we recognized the gap in the, in the global supply chain and, and started, um, creating new market opportunities for our neighbors and friends and building, building a reputation of providing, you know, quality products that, that we now sell around the world. Um, we are very invested in a safe and secure supply chain, uh, focus on food safety and, and identity pr preservation and traceability, which we'll get into. Uh, our customers value our relationship driven process and we work our, do our best to solve their unique business cha challenges. Um, we're 33 employees currently. Uh, like I said, we farm just outside of Far uh, Fargo and Castleton. Uh, we're currently uh, about 4,200 acres and we're doing soybeans, corn, and wheat. Um, and we're entering our 33rd year of, of exporting globally. Uh, we are currently working in 17 different countries. 90% uh, of our product that we, that we contract is exported. And if you actually look at the overall sales, um, just strictly sales, you know, that 10% domestic uh, number is a lot of just the clean out and the, and the byproduct that after we clean the soybeans of what we're just taking to the elevator. So, I mean, in overall sales, we're probably 95% um, exported. Um, we currently, our, our top three markets are Japan, Taiwan, and Thailand. Um, we've never shipped a single bushel of soybeans to China, um, and uh, we can certainly talk about that later if you have interest in it. But we we are contracting about two and a half million bushels under contract annually, and we're working with about you know 150 to 200 farmers and do about 75,000 acres. Um, and uh, we have two facilities: one in Castleton, and then one in Bloomer, Wisconsin. Um, and the reason I'm down in Arkansas is we're actually doing a little bit of production down in Arkansas uh, as well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the current marketplace that that we're seeing um, around the world. You know, this the pandemic has has obviously changed a lot of buying habits. Um, it's it's changed a lot of. Um, consumer loyalties, um, but food manufacturers are responding to consumer demands more than, more than ever. Um, I would say, you know, consumers today and, you know, consumers today are, are pretty demanding on, on knowing where their, where their food is coming from. 
Um, and, you know, part of that's twofold. Part of that's on us as agriculture as, as not doing a great job of really um, educating the, the consumer on, on what we do. Um, but that transparency is becoming more and more evident and more, and it's definitely an issue that, that is front and center on consumers' minds. Um, the problem that we have in agriculture is there's a hell of a lot more consumers out there than there are farmers. And, and so the, the consumers are the ones that are going to continue uh, to ask the questions um, and that's going to get filtered down all the way down to the farmer level. Um, you know, safe food is, is a big topic. Um, supply chain transparency, obviously, it's very difficult to watch news or, or um, even just go through everyday life with what you're trying to order or what you're trying to buy and not have some sort of uh, supply chain issue or supply chain, supply chain topic uh, brought up um, right now. And, and that priority on safe food, you know, in, in the United States, um, the consumers have, the, the U.S. farmers have never let down the U.S. consumer. They've, the U.S. consumer has never gone to the, to the supermarket and not had food on the shelf. Well, that's not the case in other countries. In other countries, that that has absolutely happened, and because of it, a lot of the a lot of the consumers in those countries are are very very demanding on knowing where their food is coming from, what is being applied to their food. Um, to give you an idea, in Japan, I mean, Japan imports ninety five percent of their food because I mean, Japan's an island. Japan islands are mountainous, and so there's not a lot of arable soil. And so they can't grow a lot of a lot of their food. Primarily what they're growing is rice. And and so they're importing a lot of their food. And so it matters a lot to those consumers over there where stuff is coming from. Um, and with some of the supply chain things that are happening, happening, uh, I mean, that this is a whole nother whole nother topic and a whole nother whole nother presentation on on shipping and containers right now. But uh, everything we ship is in container and we deal with it every single day. Um, on the sustainability stuff, you know, sustainability. Part of the problem with sustainability is is there's a different there's a different uh, definition of sustainability for any for depending on who you're talking to. Um, I'll tell you right now, like right now, uh, everybody's talking carbon, everybody. And, and it's a tidal wave of what's going on. And, you know, um, there's not a whole lot that, that we can do to stop that tidal wave. The, to me, from the agriculture side, there's a couple flaws in, in the carbon, in the carbon, um, in the carbon system in that, in that a currently, um, I mean, when you see some of these major companies saying we're going to be carbon neutral by such and such date, well, that's great. All they're doing is, is by paying their way out of it. They aren't actually changing anything that they're doing in their company. Now, I think that that'll eventually change. Um, but there's, there's a problem with that. And, and, Quite frankly, the second thing is carbon doesn't necessarily resonate with with farmers on making them sustainable. Uh, you know, and all the farmers I talk to, I said, okay, what is what does carbon mean to you? And they're like, you know, really not that much. Um, but if they want to pay me to do it, I'll I'll take a look at it. And absolutely, I I fully understand that. But but things that move the needle with farmers are more so you know, water quality and soil retention. And, and those types of metrics are things that, that the farmers care about because that directly affects you on your farm. And so there's a lot of different things happening right now um, in terms of sustainability that, that um, I think are, are gonna be coming down the pipe and, and guys need to be ready and doing their homework on things. Um, there's this, this carbon thing is moving so fast that um, there's going to be a lot of things out there. Just make sure you understand uh, what, what you're looking at. And, and, uh, and, and quite frankly, if it works for your operation, do it. Um, because, you know, 
I don't know a single farmer that doesn't want to make more money, uh, which is why you're at this, which is why you're at this, this conference or this, this uh, meeting today. Um, and then last but not least is the IP and traceability. Um, you know, this, these two things is what absolutely allows us to add value back to the value added acre. Uh, you know, in, in non-GMO soybeans and organic soybeans, um, there's markets that are just basic non-GMO beans and they're not identity preserved. Um, and so those markets are markets that, that don't necessarily differentiate. And quite frankly, uh, because of our, our area in the country and our freight disadvantage, we aren't going to play in those, in those arenas very competitively. But when it comes to identity preser preser pre preserved soybeans and traceable soybeans, we can we can play in that game all day. And so traceability is basically gives us the ability to track um, to track the beans from the farmer all the way to the end user. Um, traceability is something that we're that we are um, trying to. Uh, make a little bit easier. Um, right now, obviously, the heaviest lift on the whole thing is is trying to get the data from the farm to to the end user in in the form that the end users are asking for it without making or being real intrusive to the farmer. And quite frankly, you know, from a traceability standpoint, you know, we can't necessarily trace back to a field. Um, because farmers don't store their crop by field, they store their crop by bin. And, you know, we can say, okay, there's five loads from this field and three loads from this field, but we don't know exactly that it's going to be from that field. Um, but one of the things that we're working on right now as a company is, is we are working on developing a, a pipeline of data, so to speak, where, where some of our internal um, software will will be able to talk directly with the farmers, whether it's um, my John Deere, or whether it's Raven, or whether it's um, you know whether it's Climate, whatever whatever software program that farmer is using in their tractor, and they just basically give us give us access, and we go in and and pull the planting records and the harvest records and the spray rates and the spray dates. Um, and the farmers don't have to double enter stuff when, when we ask for it. Um, right now, that's the basic info that, that, the, that the consumers are asking for. Um, you know, but they don't need to know adjuvants. They don't need to know water. They just want to know that, that guys are, are spraying um, the herbicides at the rates that they're supposed to be spraying at and not spraying off label and things like that. Um, and so uh, it's... It's a burden. Currently, there's we we have tried everything under the sun in the last 18 years to to make the process of data transfer from the farm to us more seamless and easier for the farmer. And quite frankly, we are back to the point of just calling the farmer and asking, "Okay, grab your records, sit down. I'll take them over the phone from you," because, but you know, I mean, there's just not an easy way, and the, and it's just you know, not on the front of the mind of the farmer. And so when, when they're doing all their other things, they just don't think about it. And, and I've yet to really meet a farmer that likes paperwork. Um, and so, you know, if we can, if we can get to this uh, point, I think it's, it's something that's going to be um, really handy and, and will work really well for, for both the farmer and the consumer. Um, but, but you're starting to see even some of the large grain facilities being asked for this type of information. And, and that's just nearly impossible when you have a 110 car shuttle facility. Um, you know, that's just not how our grain system is set up and, and the movement of grain is not set up in our country like that. So um, those types of, of big movements and those grain facilities are going to, are going to have a difficult time, um, trying to work through it, but they're working on it uh, because they're getting asked the same questions we are. Um, but one of the reasons why traceability works for us is because we do identity preserved. Um, that identity preserved is simply just keeping varieties separate. 
if we go to a company in Thailand and they buy Pioneer 91 M10 soybeans, when when they when we go to ship to them, we ship them Pioneer 91 M10 soybeans. It's not just all soybeans are created equal. Every soybean variety um, is sold specific to a customer and they're buying that variety because every variety makes their end product taste just a little bit different. And that's why, that's why some, a lot of the times when you're looking at our variety guides and things the, the food manufacturers don't necessarily change, change varieties as often as, as varieties come onto the market because just because of, of the impact it has on their, on their end product. Um, but if, if they are able to find a bean that, that tastes the same or better, they will absolutely, um, they'll absolutely take a look at it. And so when we're looking at our genetic lineup, you know, currently we're working with 14 different varieties that we forward contract. And that's a lot. Um, that's a lot because on our, you know, when we're, when we're cleaning and we're shipping, I mean, every time that we change varieties, we have a different shipment. We have to clean up our entire facility, which takes about three quarters of a day uh, to do a full blowdown and, and clean. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of downtime that comes with that many varieties, but we also want to have the ability to be able to fit varieties on all types of soil types and all types of maturity ranges. And so we have to have um, that, that lineup as well. And so that's where, you know, we're constantly looking at, at our varietal lineup. We're constantly looking at ways to become more efficient on cleaning. And, and, um, you know, that's, those are some of the things that, that play into, um, some of the, some of the lineup that we're, that we're offering, but quite frankly, we go to the end user first with any new genetics and make sure it's going to work for them. And then from there, we go back to the farmer. Um, you know, we obviously look at agronomics and then we look at food, food quality. And then we go back to the farmer and say, okay, this is what has been approved. So we've got, we've got varieties, um, all across the board that, that work for everybody. Um, is there any questions so far on, on some of the stuff I'm, I've been talking about? Sweet. Um, yep. yep. Scott, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was wondering, um, like, so when you need, I guess, essentially more acres of something, do you have farmers coming to you or do you, you know, tend to go to the folks that are, you're already working with and ask if they want to put in, you know, more acres or how do you, um, I guess, how do you have new, new farmers grow for you? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a little bit of both. Um, so we've been on a pretty steady growth curve. Um, so we're, we typically uh, are, like next year, we already know we're, we're likely going to be increasing again, um, increasing our, our acreage and our footprint. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times uh, we've, we've got, you know, we always go to our current grower base to see if they, you know, what they want to, what they want to do. But we also are always looking at, at new farmers um, and, and trying to um, increase the amount of farmers that we're working with because, you know, the more farmers we have, the less, you know, it spreads our weather risk a little bit too. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of times uh, I'll get a phone call from a farmer and, and, you know, we'll just talk through some of the things in, in our contract and talk through how the pro program works. And, and uh, you know, it, it absolutely um, could be a fit for them. And, and, you know, sometimes it's not, and that's okay. Um, but, uh, you know, I, definitely encourage calling and seeing what, what could work. Um, because the, the bottom line, like I said, I don't I haven't met a farmer yet that wants to, doesn't want to make more money. So, uh, the bottom line looks pretty good on it. Have you been contracting with many guys very far West? I know like five, six years ago, due to freights and transportation, it didn't really pencil out. Is that getting better? Is that about the same? Yeah. So that, another great question. So we, we did actually did some contracts up in that area about uh, 10, 12 years ago. And, you know, at that time, um, at that time it was, we were doing some irrigated stuff. We did some flood irrigated stuff over by Sydney. Uh, we did some irrigated stuff uh, kind of by Ray. We did some, some other stuff 
Um, oh gosh, I can't remember the, it's just, just west of Glendive. And yeah, I mean, freight is always, I mean, anything out there is basically freight driven. Um, but, you know, we've got, we've got potentially um, some receiving uh, station capability out there that, that um, could, that could work in terms of a, a contract um, in terms of a contract for that general area. You know, one of the things that's actually hasn't worked real well for us out in that area is, is we, we haven't had a real good variety that, that is, that I feel comfortable with working in that area. Um, I have, we have literally been looking for an early maturity soybean that would work well out there for a very long time. And I thought I had one a couple of years ago and it just fell on its face in the trials. And so we just, we scrapped it and went back to the drawing board. And um, I think we have now, I feel pretty good. We have a 0 0.1 and even a double double 009 um, that I think we're going to be able to do some contracts on. And, and so, you know, in our current variety lineup, we just have had a, we've had a pretty big hole in that real early maturity range. Uh, just because some of the stuff on the market just wasn't a good food grade bean. It's, it's a, it's fine just as a non-GMO bean, but it's not a good food grade bean. And, uh, and so now we're getting to that point. And I think that um, as we, as we build those acres um, that it could, it could potentially be a fit. Hey, Scott, Ryan Edinger with AGT Foods. I have a question on your talk. Never heard of you. What's that? <laughs> Never heard of you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, got a question for you. You mentioned on the chemicals. Yep. About uh, growers, you know, getting records and giving them to you. Have you had your customers ever require testing on your soybeans, like uh, like down to parts per million, parts per billion on different chemicals, or is it just primarily records? Uh, so we, we have to do that with every lot of soybeans, um, that we ship. And so primarily, so in our contracts, we have, um, there's a few, there's a few herbicides that, that are approved here for use that we can't use. Um, and we can't use them. One is chloroperifus, which is going away. It just got banned anyway by the EPA. Um, the other one is um, Gramoxone or Paraquat um, for burn down and then Roundup for burn down as well. Um, and the reason is, and so in some countries, so I'm going to use Thailand as an example. In Thailand, they actually, they actually listed Paraquat and Chloroporifus on the hazardous list. And so they have a zero tolerance for any residue on, that, on those soybeans and on with those two herbicides and so if if something were to show up on a chemical residue so at customs they they randomly inspect the containers as they come in they're not they're not checking every single one but um as as they come in they randomly inspect and if they find any residue uh they will they put you on a list and then they stop every single one of your containers. And we do not want to be on that list. I guarantee you that. And so we're, we're pretty, we're pretty, um, we work with our farmers and educate our farmers pretty well to make sure that those aren't being sprayed. Um, but we test everything because every country is different in terms of, in terms of, um, MRLs, um, for chemical residue. And so, you know, it's and the, it's important to for the farmers to understand that that those levels, even even GMO tolerances, that is not that is not customer, that's not customer driven. That is a country spec, and so if it shows up at customs and it's higher than the level allowed into the country, it's not getting into the country, and and so we're much better off making sure that that we don't ship something that that has that. Um, because shipping stuff back is a lot more expensive than it is shipping it over there. All right. So just a couple of things, um, that I wanted to just chat about with some of the, some of the stuff that, 
Um, you know, if I'm a farmer looking at doing uh, any any type of contracting, um, there's a lot of different stuff in contracts, and it's really just making sure you understand and and trust the person you're working with. Um, but you know, there's there's different types of contracts out there. There's total production. There's specified amount contracts. Um, you know, with our contracts, there's everything's based on Chicago Board of Trade. There's a lot of the crops being grown in that area that that aren't Board of Trade um, driven, uh, price driven, and so understand how the Board of Trade works. Um, you know, knowing what your timeline is for picking your price, how that all works. Um, understanding your your specs in your contract and and what your risks are. Um, you know, every you it's pretty easy in a contract to see what opportunities are, but you also, you also should understand your risks. Um, but, but I'll tell you, you know, everybody want, you know, and Ryan, Ryan will, will obviously um, understand this for sure, but you know, our companies don't make any money if we, if we don't sell product. <laughs> and so uh, we're not out to, to reject a whole pile of product. If, if, um, if we can use it, we will. And, and quite frankly, we've gotten pretty good at, at uh, spit shine and stuff that, that may not be the best spec, but we, we will try our best because at our company, we don't, we don't speculate on this market. We don't go out and just contract and hope to sell these soybeans. When we contract, the beans are sold already. Uh, and so we just figure back our acres we need on that variety. We add a little bit of a buffer for um, weather. And then once we hit that target, we hit that target and we're done. Um, and so, you know, if we have stuff that doesn't work for our customer, doesn't work for our spec, we're shorting our customer and we don't want to do that either because it's food, right? And so they want to make sure they can keep their, their, uh, their manufacturing plants going. Um, but you, you should understand, you know, how the payment process works, um, you know, cash flow and how that fits into your operation. Uh, delivery is, you know, if it's delivered at a specified time, you can deliver when you want. If it's buyer's call, however it is, where you're going to deliver, uh, what the act of God is, you know, things like that. Uh, I've had a lot of questions on bonded versus credit sale contracts uh, and how that all works. Um, so you should, you should understand that a little bit. And then, uh, you know, what kind of information are you required to, to report on? Um, you know, some of that, and that just kind of goes back to what, to what I was um, talking about a little bit, a little bit earlier, but uh, it's a great market. Um, the demand is strong as ever. The, the customers, I'll tell you really, really like grow or buying from our region, um, North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, um, they really like it and, and they like it because if you think about North Dakota agriculture, you know, there's nowhere else in the country that has the diversity in agriculture that we do. And, and quite frankly, just about everything that we raise is food. Um, we, we grow so much food and the farmers understand contracts. They understand quality. They understand, um, they have the right mindset and the right attitude to do it. And, and the end users really appreciate that. Um, I mean, I can't tell you enough. Um, that's one of the reasons why our, our customer from Japan is here. I mean, he, he's just like, I, I got to get over there. And we took him around to meet a couple of the farmers because he's just gotten to know them uh, as we've been working with them for as long as we have. And, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a great market to, to play in and, and uh it, uh, it works. You just got to understand what, what's expected, what the expectations are. So, uh, any other questions for, for me about SBNB or what we do? Scott, I'm really curious. You said, you know, your primary buyers were like Thailand, Japan, you might've said Taiwan. Yep. Um, why hasn't China looked into specialty soybean? Um, so Ch Ch China, China is, um, China, let's just, let's, well, two, two things. China's kind of like Walmart, right? Um, I mean, you have to be prepared to supply China when China comes calling. But at the same time, um, you also have to be prepared from a, um, you got to make sure you have all of your, oh, 
all of your logos uh, copyrighted and, and all that stuff and everything's good to go. China up until 2016 has, ha, they grow their own food grade soybeans in China. And they only import GMO beans for crush. They don't import any of the GMO beans for food. And so uh, they actually put a tariff on, on their food grade soybeans leaving the country because they knew that they needed to keep them in country to, to, feed, their, to feed their population. In 2016, um, they were, their supply was quickly um, becoming short of their demand. And so they were out already starting trying to build relationships on, on things. And, and we have an employee that works overseas that is Chinese speaking that that has been doing a lot of research in, in China. Um, but then when all the tariff stuff hit, um, then that kind of put a halt on some of that because obviously it priced us right out of the market. Um, and, and so now we're, we're getting close to, to being ready to, to be able to do some, st some more stuff in China, but, but right now we just haven't shipped them anything. Um, the biggest market for us that we see other than China right now is India. Um, India is a massive, and I mean, me and Ryan, me and Ryan are probably going to have to arm wrestle on India a little bit, but, um, India is, is a market of, you know, one point however many billion people and you know 385 million of them are vegan so it's a pretty big soy soy consumption market and you know it's a population of vegans bigger than the united states so uh, but currently uh, they have pretty pretty strict protectionist policies on imports and tariffs things like that so which we're trying to work through 